So uh, welcome guys to the Google Podcast. I'm your host Rob Watson and today's guest is David Hyatt who is the founder of Hewitt Jeans, um, which is based in Cardigan in West Wales. Uh, the ethos is to do one thing well. And because of that approach, many say they're actually making the best jeans on the planet right now. And to be honest, I have to agree because I've owned a pair for the past seven years. Um, and also when I started this podcast, I had a list of uh, some people, the kind of people that I wanted to have on this podcast and uh, David was on that list. So I'm, um, you know, I'm nearly two years into doing it now and it's nicer to get on there. And it's not just because they make the best jeans, but it's actually because the, the whole story behind the company, the fact that they're bringing craftsmanship back to a town, which was desperately in need of it and start making things again in this country. And I think that's something that I think more of us can be inspired about to, to begin to make and stuff again. So welcome, David. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So thank you for your time. So, so we're actually um, speaking on very unusual times. It's become the new normal, um, but it appears that your factory's kind of switched from making jeans at the moment to, to doing something else with your time. So do you mind just uh, elaborating on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... And it's really down to Claire, who's also a co-founder. And um, we're sort of making some scrubs at the moment and not huge amounts, but I mean, some amounts. And um, and so we're also uh, able to cut much more than we can make. So we're then cutting a lot for other people to go and make because with scrubs, they're very simple garments. So, um, you know, people with a machine, sewing machine at home, uh, we deliver them on the doorstep, you know, like 10, 10 uh, cuts, and, and then they can make from the cut. Uh, and then they, you know, we pick up from the doorstep and it's like, like it's almost like a, a doorstep army type thing. Um, so we, we've made hundreds, if not thousands of scrubs now. And, um, uh, you know, that's, you know, big respect to the team really for making all that stuff happen really. Yeah, that's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? I suppose because you're small, you can be quite agile and to sort of... Yeah, uh, it's, it's suddenly, uh, yeah, it's that thing of when, you know, like the desire, you know, actually, can we do something? Um, and even if it's just a small thing, it's something. Um, and you know, suddenly you get pictures of nurses wearing, you know, the scrubs and stuff and you go, okay, yeah, this is... Um, and. Uh, and my mum, who you know was a nurse all her life, you know, suddenly going, "Wow, yeah," she's suddenly phoning up Claire and going, "Wow, uh, you know, well done for making that happen." So. That's amazing. And I saw on Instagram the little tags that you put inside of each of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't quite remember what it was, but it was um, it just obviously coming from copywriting background. Uh, you guys have, um, have named. Yeah, I think it was just like, as simple as in these times, just thanks for everything. Uh, so. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my sister was a nurse as well. So I kind of sort of grown up having a deep respect for nurses, um, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, they're in the front line right now. And it's, uh, oh, yeah, it's tough. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the benefits of this time was finally valuing some of the people that in the past haven't been with its nurses and doctors and even um, you know teachers who are still working and helping you know children with disabilities and stuff to show that they're the ones it's not the the footballers or the you know the celebrities that get all the yeah attention. no it's it's a it's nice to see a spotlight shine on like people who are doing things and you know sometimes in society we celebrate you know people for all sorts of different reasons and we forget about actually the real heroes are those right now in hospitals turning up and having to put themselves in 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 the line of danger i mean to help everyone else and, and that's um that's something um i always remember i don't know if it was an advert or something and um it was a picture of people fleeing from a, a fire and i think the headline just said you know could you run the other way and those are those are the heroes aren't they where they go and do the thing and they don't get paid particularly well. Um, and I, I think in a society, you suddenly go, yeah, maybe some aspects of that will come where we reset what's important and who's important in terms of community. And sometimes we celebrate those people, you know, with uh, big Instagram accounts and 
when they've done very little really um, and th those people are real heroes you know putting themselves in danger yeah it, it's so true if this would have just happened for say a week or so everything would have kind of bounced back quick enough and we wouldn't have had yeah. enough time to reflect and really see what's going on. But because it's, you know, as we speak now, it is the 12th of May, you know, it's been going on for good two solid months now. And I think however yeah. long, whether we're in the middle of it or wherever it is, you know, it's, it's going to happen that enough to probably really shift a lot of our perspective. So, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be a bumpy ride. Oh, no, I think it's definitely, I think, um, well, there's a couple of, things I think about that is it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, I think the, you know, the economy has gone to the equivalent of a, the dentist um, and they've given us a painkiller. Um, but at some point we're going to come out of the dentist and go, oh, actually that hurt. Um, I think that won't come for a while because um, we'll have the initial bounce and then um, it'll be definitely bumpy. I think maybe the bigger thing or maybe the better thing to come out of it is people have suddenly got off the treadmill they're on and, and ask themselves really good questions going, wow, uh, what, why are some aspects of this do I feel really good about? Um, because um, they'll have a, like time to reflect and, and, and work out they're, they're, they've been busy for the last five years on this treadmill where actually they don't, they don't really like it. They're doing it just because they have to. Um, they're working for money, not for love. And, um, and I, I think that's going to be really interesting to see how many people quit. And, you know, like, yes, I know. Also, I'm very acutely aware that some people are going to lose their jobs. And, but it'll be interesting, you know, like those people are going, Do you know, what? I was on, I climbed the wrong mountain, climbed this mountain and maybe I'm at the top of it and I don't even like the view. Yeah, absolutely. And it, like you say, you know, we think it'd be a bumpy ride, but it might be in in two, five, ten years, we might look at this as the catalyst for that change of people on an individual level, but also as a collective, the way we're living, you know, mass consumerism, you know, fast fashion, you know, everything, yeah. everything's fast, fast, fast. And as you yeah, said yeah. about the, the conveyor belt, it's it's almost you just people are just on it because everyone else is on it. And now yeah, you know, no. everyone's off it. So, no, yeah. and uh, you know, like rather than maybe the thing I've gone, oh, am I a good consumer? Yeah, oh, I was pretty good. Tick is you know, that reassessment of the importance of um, you know, how much we really need each other, um, and you know, like the importance of you know, for me, like the town that I live in, and um, you know, can I contribute to it? Um, and I think businesses are going to have to maybe unlearn quite a lot of things that they've learned. And so it's going to be a fascinating, like literally a fascinating experiment globally. Um, and that global reassessment of going, mm, I don't need, you know, yes, I miss certain aspects of the old way, but some aspects of this new way of, I'm thinking are much more interesting to me. Yeah, absolutely. So from the outside looking in, um, people will see that you seem like, you know, very successful entrepreneur. You've, um, you've been running Hyatt for many years now. And before that you had uh, another business, but it hasn't always been, um, you know, making jeans hasn't always been your first love. Um, and what you know? What, can we go back, right back a little bit? I like to tell people stories a bit because sometimes. Yeah, no, I mean, I think like most entrepreneurs, it's um, it's never a straight path. Um, I mean, at sixteen, I, you know, I persuaded my dad that I could leave, you know, do my A levels, go start a company, be amazingly successful, um, because I had a, a strong desire to go and start some brands and. Um, and then at 16 and a half, I was bankrupt and you know, I'd lost all the money and, um, and, you know, so it's always a, a really interesting rockety, rockety ride. And, um, but there was great learning there. And, uh, I remember he asked me, um, you know, so, um, what did you learn from this? And I said, well, I learned, that I really love it. Actually, I love running uh, a business 
And he said, well, okay, so the second piece of learning is now to go and get good at it so you can stay doing what you love. Um, and uh, and uh, then I went, you know, just to give you a, a quick backstory, went to um, college, got some you know, things, got kick, kicked out of college at 21, ended up at Saatchi and Saatchi, you know, seven years there. Um, you know, uh, and then we pitched for Adidas, um, which made me fall back in love with the original idea when I was 16 and a half. Um, and the CEO of um, Saatchi and Saatchi at that point said he was going to buy Adidas. Um, I think Charles and Morris managed to fall out with him, so we didn't win the pitch. Um, I took a £20,000 pay cut to go and work for the company that won the you know, advertising account for Adidas. I spent a year and a half writing ads that my boss simply didn't get. Um, and uh, those ads became the voice for, for Howie's. So to answer your question is I started you know, Howie's again with Claire in 1995. And you know we we started with just T-shirts, and we put our, our words and our feelings on some T-shirts and hoped that they would be bought. And we were aiming at mountain bikers and skateboarders because that's the thing that we loved. And and in the end, actually, it took off, um, and it became yeah, it became quite a, a success. Um, and um, but it's so it was a definitely uh, it was a a, a wonky journey there and uh, the straight line is never that straight I think did you when you set up how was it was it you, you were setting up from your home or did you oh yeah and no, we were literally um yeah on our sort of living room floor packing t-shirts um Claire had a, <clears throat> a company called mailbox next to her work so she'd take the orders in that day or that morning, and then uh, I'd pack them up at night, and you know it was as simple as that. And we put a little advert in a little magazine, and and you know, and we got a response. It wasn't a huge response, but it was enough to go, oh my god, the people who were into it were really into it. And I always look for like the heat, not just the number, and and the heat was strong. And I'm going, oh, and we wanted to do it, and. And, you know, like we started in 95 and we got our first paycheck in 2001. And, and people kind of like, uh, you know, is, do you have the patience um, to uh, build something? Uh, because sometimes they can't pay you straight away. And, uh, and the, the, the problem with the acorn is we judge it in a, in a three month or six months and you go, it, it just doesn't grow that quick. Um, but it, it was uh, definitely uh, um, a journey, and um, we hadn't never done it before, so it was all new. So for those six years without a paycheck, were you still working? Yeah, I was still working. So I was kind of funded by, you know, I would go and write ads in the day, and then um, we would go and play you know, with this thing at night. And, um, and I think there's a beauty sometimes of that thing of – when you don't quit on something, even if it doesn't pay you, you know there's a like something quite deep there. It's like hobbies are pretty interesting because you do them, and a, like a hobby doesn't necessarily pay you. So therefore, it tells you that actually you have a strong feeling for that thing, and and sometimes you need to keep going. So like five years, you go oh I didn't get you know paid, and then it grew, and you know, we ended up. Lots of people, um, lots of companies wanted to buy that company, and so, so we'd done something right. Um, and because we had companies like, um, she was called PPR then, but now called Kensin, but they own Gucci, Yves Saint Laurent, Puma, and they'd made a short list of two companies in the world they wanted to buy. And uh, you know, one was Quicksilver, and one was Howie's. Yeah. We had Steve Case wanting to invest $25, $30 million in Howie's if we moved to uh, Ojai in California. And Steve Case started AOL. Um, I mean, so we had lots of all that kind of stuff going on. And you know, Japan's richest guy you know, wanted to do something. Um, so we'd done something on a real budget. 
but we've done something with with, with some real in like honest intent and it, it seemed to strike a chord with a lot of people yeah but that's really interesting to to hear that the backstory to it and i think often people like you say about acorns taking a while to grow i think the way things are perceived now with founders and entrepreneurs it's like it has to happen now there needs to be all this seed money in place but actually, yeah and I, and I, 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 like i really have not issues with it because sometimes you need to go and get some money to do it you know especially in tech you know to go and build some stuff really quickly because you know, someone else is going to beat you i get that but i also get that thing of growing something well growing it um you know just as much as you can in the time that you have um and so you don't rush it you don't force it and and people are forcing these companies to grow like and and in the end sometimes they just collapse and and the journey for the founder is pretty miserable because they've had to compromise in so many ways and so so money can be a blessing or a curse if you go and get a ton of funding it becomes you become compromised on the the dream and sometimes you're better off having no money and just sticking with the dream and and you build it over time and then all of a sudden you people go oh my god like how did you build that you go well um we built it uh, through hard work actually uh, and and i'm not giving up and 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 those things are actually rare in these times where everybody wants something now. Well, the acorn, I don't care how fast you rush it, the acorn is n not going to grow any faster just because you want it to. And doesn't really matter how much funding you got. That acorn takes a time, and you respect the time. I think all great companies take a, a bunch of time to to go and build and. I, I think there's a real danger for young entrepreneurs now to go, oh, I'll go and get the money, I'll fast track this and I'll flip it. And uh, yes, you'll have a ton of money. Um, but what did you actually build? Like what, you know, was it actually the dream that you dreamt? Or, you know, did it get compromised so much that actually you can't even recognize the, the original thing anymore? And I see a lot of founders, you know, like you look them in the eye and they're super... Uh, they've lost the love and uh and they took the money and you go oh well done and, and and there's another way though there's another way and it's called hard work and 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 there's another way to fund your business is go and sell your product and people have forgotten that and you go actually no that's how you do it and um you know like for us at the do lectures you know, we haven't paid ourselves now in 12 years. We, this was going to be the year where we'd actually start paying ourselves. Um, and, you know, obviously everything, you know, got changed with the, you know, the virus. But, you know, we had a 1.2 billion pound events company going, oh, we want to buy the do lectures. And I'm going, we've done that before. We're not doing that again. So sometimes the most beautiful thing you can give to your idea is patience. And, and hard work. And people don't actually want to know that anymore. And you go, everybody wants it tomorrow. And you go, hmm, tricky. I don't, anyway, I actually I haven't seen that work too well. And before I started Hyatt, I um, uh, had a conversation with uh, you know, somebody I, I respect a lot, um, you know, Ivan Chenard at Patagonia. And uh, I said to him, I said, because we nearly did something with Howie's in Patagonia. We were actually um, very much, I don't know, we were, they were way ahead of us, but we were doing some interesting things. And so there was quite a few conversations between you know, Patagonia and, and Howie's and in, in all sorts of weird ways. But I, I sort of said to him, like, how did you keep hold of Patagonia? And I wanted to know that question before I started doing Hyatt and he said, oh, and he's, <laughs> he's an interesting character. And he said, well, you know, 40 years hard work. And I'm going, oh yeah, um, I should have known. And he said, oh, and also uh, two remortgages. And I went, oh yeah. And 
I think when people see businesses and they see and read things in magazines, they, they just want to know the overnight aspect of it. They want to know the glamour of it. And, and they don't want to do, like always want to do the hard work of it. And, um, and sometimes, um, you know, that where it really does test you. Um, and so they want the glamour, but they, they don't want the grit. Uh, but I think grit actually builds businesses, not glamour. Um, uh, and so that's where suddenly you go, that's, I, I have deep respect for VC funding because some of it is so smart. Um, but uh, a lot of it's not. And, um, and I think, you know, one piece of advice to anybody out there is go and, <clears throat> go and raise the slowest money you can because it's gonna take a bunch of time. If you actually truly wanna go and grow something meaningful, it takes time and grit. Very wise words. So what made you sell Howie's then? Well, I, I tell you what it was. It was like um, a lack of confidence. We thought um, uh, we needed um, you know, the help of others. And actually we didn't. We just needed more confidence that we could actually do it. And when you're doing something for the first time, we didn't have enough certainty and we didn't have enough confidence. And, you know, um, and actually, you know, if we had more people on the team that had experience of doing what we were doing, we wouldn't have done it. And, and there's no regrets. It's just, um, you know, that's the honest answer to that question is like, there's no regrets, but if we had um, uh, some different members of the team with more experience then we probably had more confidence and probably had more certainty that actually we didn't need anyone and, and that was the truth we didn't actually need anyone i watched one of your recent talk well not a recent talk i watched it recently but and you were saying that it was really um it was kind of killing you guys you and claire doing it like putting all the time in and the effort it was just well you managed to it was a good route out anyway yeah, and it's um, and the, the, the thing is, um, everything's learning, and so you know, and uh, and we've taken all that learning now into Hyatt, and we can do it, you know, like um, more um, slowly. You know, we can build the team. You know, we, we can do it on our sort of. Um, our sort of bequest where we go, we wanted to do this stuff. Um, we don't want it to do this thing. And, and I think with the inexperience of last time with Howie's where we were just going, we were, you know, the ego was very much um, uh, pushing things forward. Um, whereas now it's much more about like, okay, let's, um, how do we help the town? How do we help the team? Um, and, you know, there's many communities within a building a business and um and we're much more respectful of all of them now so on higher then um what I, what i'm getting from it all and what i've taken from it is that you've got this mission it's the mission that drives you rather than the ego because it's just wanting to get self-satisfaction and grow and to be successful it's the mission behind it so you, will you tell us a little bit about what it is what's so special about cardigan and, and what's happened there in the past yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, given that it's a very small town, 4,000 people, more sheep than um, people, and it's on the, the, the far western edge of West Wales, so it's, it's actually technically closer to Ireland than to even Cardiff. And so, um, but it had Britain's biggest jeans factory, and, you know, which is kind of just odd. And it made 35,000 pairs of jeans uh, um, a week but nearly 40 years and and then back in 2002 that factory closed because they discovered they could go make them somewhere else cheaper um, but it was a very efficient factory it was very profitable until the, you know, the last day um, and you know then 400 world-class makers had nothing to make and so for me like um, you know my thing after Howie's is I, I did actually generally feel a bit like burnt out by it all. And, 
Uh, I'd written a plan to make jeans, but I put it on a shelf and just went, mm, I'm not sure if I truly want to go and run around that same track twice. And, uh, and then somebody you know, in a phone call said, actually, Dave, it's not really about you, it's about the town. And that actually really made me think, going, actually, if I don't do that, if I don't do this thing, then that 40 years of learning will just be discarded and, and we will always be then a, just a, a tourist town and, and nothing wrong with like tourism, but, uh, but we were a maker town. We knew how to make something. And, and I think like, you know, like just like we can lose confidence. Um, um, you know, like the, the town had an identity as a maker town and then all of a sudden it stopped making and, and it, you know, economically it was having a tough time, but like, I think confidence, it was having a tough time. You, you kind of lose like, what are we about again? And, and, and towns have identities. And so we just thought, you know, myself and Claire just thought, well, if we have the marketing ability and the branding ability and, and, you know, the makers really truly know how to make a pair of jeans like almost no one else on the planet. Then if we could combine those things uh, together and have this amazing thing happen, which is the internet. So when you put those three things together, you go, oh, maybe we can make this thing work. Maybe we, you know, we can. And, and as long as we're patient and, and as long as we try and serve our community and as long as we try and like make the best product, and we only stick to that, you know, like, like the, the problem with lots of companies is they try and do everything. And you go like, we only know how to make jeans. Uh, and that's all we know. That's all the town has learned. Um, but it's an incredible skill. And, and you go, well, there might be enough business there if we can do something extremely well to get as many jobs as back as we can. So yes, the big dream is, to get 400 people their jobs back. I think at the moment we're at 30 and I'm going, uh, like both are, both are like success. Like if those 30 people are, you know, come in and have a great place to work, um, that's success. If we can get 400 people their jobs back, that's success as well. But every bit is success. And, and so, I have that big crazy goal, but also I'm just going, you know, but um, like, let's also celebrate where, where we are now. And, um, and um, we've never been closer to 31. Um, and so uh, it, it all feels good. And it's, and being able to be patient with stuff. Because if you if you study financial models, you know the the real superpower is compound interest, but it's just how little sums get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Um, and but you just have to have patience, and you just go like, um, our, our quest is, can we get better, you know, like today than we were yesterday? If we say that enough, then we're going to be a pretty interesting company by the end of the week. We're going to be a pretty interesting company by the end of the month, um, let alone the end of the year. And I feel that's our, our approach. And, and so, um, but you know, we're working with an incredibly talented team and, and in a way that's the joy. And when you sort of see members of your team fly and do well, um, you know, that for an entrepreneur is really, the joy of it. What's nice I've seen as well is um, obviously you've got some grandmasters that have been, I think you're saying about spending like 30,000 hours maybe making jeans. Yeah. And is it Claudio? Claudio, is it? Um, yeah. He's made a good appearance on a few of the videos and I believe, yeah, did, he, yeah. did he retire at the end of 2019? No, he, he tried to. Um, it's, um, you know, the R word, I call it the retirement word, but um but he's actually, he's, he's sticking around to, uh, which is a lovely part of the story, is he's training his son how to cut. So he spent 40 years cutting, and now he's spending the last 12 months, you know, both training um, his son and Rob, uh, so that you know, he's, he's now passing those skills on um, you know, to both his son and to Rob. 
And I, I remember him saying to me, and it was a really like when, when, you know, sometimes words get to your heart and he said, look, you know, my biggest worry is that I wouldn't actually have anyone to pass my skills on to. And I went, Oh gosh, it is actually important that we, we, we pass these skills onto the next generation. And, and, um, and there's beauty in like being able to make something. Uh, and do you mean it's like, uh, um, and you can, you know, there's that it fascinates me that you go, you can go from sketch to prototype and, you know, to trying something out in, in an afternoon and, um, you know, being able to prototype, being able to make, I mean, that's something that's really like important. And, and maybe we're sort of realizing we've outsourced pretty much everything. And, and, and the part of the reason we have no scrubs in the UK is, is no one makes them. And then you go, mm, um, how's that, how's that, how's that work in a crisis? Well, it doesn't. And, uh, in, you know, going back to your earlier questions, everything's on like a reboot, a reset. Um, we've got a lot, we've got some thinking to do. That also ties in a little bit for me with Brexit and, um, you know, this country, and I've heard it in your talks, and I think this as well, like it's got an abundance of creativity. Some of the, some of the creations in this country are just phenomenal. And if we were to focus on that more and start making stuff again in this country, like what you guys are doing, then that is the solution to a lot of it. Yeah. And I think that the one thing that we do particularly well is we're a creative country. I mean, we're, you know, we have some of the best music in the world. I mean, it, you know, like, you know, anim the animation industry, I mean, when you start, you know, even the software industry, God, we're like, we're doing some incredible things. And, um, and I think we just like anything, you've got to stick to what we're really good at. And that is actually come up with ideas. You know, you know, you think Tim Berners-Lee, you know, on top of the road, trying to get some widgets together to go and, oh, let's, I've got this idea for the internet. Mm, okay. Maybe that'll work. Um, you know, we've got the people and it's just getting back to like, should we just concentrate on what we're really good at? And that is creativity and, you know, and in schools, maybe we shouldn't be trying to take creativity out of the schools and maybe we should try and put it back. Um, because that's the thing in this world that where we are like you know, a mile ahead of most people. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing, um, just getting back to you with the jobs, you know, you might not get to 400 and even if it's at 30 or it goes up to 50, that's great. But the great thing is, is if you wouldn't have stepped in with Hyatt, is that that gap, that skill set could have been lost in a generation. But because you've oh, got yeah. likes of Claudio uh, passing this information on um, and teaching them, it reminds me of when I see them, them master craftsmen, woodworkers, and yeah, yeah. You know, is it in Japan and someone, the, the apprentice works with them for like 15 years yeah, before yeah. They're, they're even at that level. And that's, it ties back into the stuff we're saying before about people just want to go and do an online course for six weeks and think that they're a master at something. It's like, no, you have to have the patience, the hard work, the determination yeah, yeah. to get it out of us. Um, yeah, so yeah. yeah. And I think Japan honors the craft really well and, um, and I think they have huge respect for the maker, um, the craftsperson, um, and they they apply patience to it. And and I think we got to get we got to lose that thing of going let's build it, flip it, and you know, aren't we the, the the creative hero? You go no, actually, like if you truly love something, you don't sell it. Uh, and, and you know the Howie's thing for me was a bit sweet because actually. I suddenly sold it. I had a bunch of money and the, the people who owned it didn't really care about it. And, and, and to be honest, it's done nothing since really of any note that I can see. That's not me. I wish it had, uh, I wish it you know, was born to do amazing things. And um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, if there's only one thing you get out of this podcast is like, give your idea some patience give it the respect that it needs and then it needs the time and all things need that time, whether it's friendships, businesses, you know, whatever it is, it's, you know, these things never really happen. You, you don't 
build something brilliant in three, three months, three years and go, Oh, aren't I the clever person? Not really. You know, selling, selling something you really love isn't clever. It's actually dumb when you, all you got in exchange for it is a big bunch of money. Yeah, very wise words. Um, and what was the time frame between you selling Howie's? Like how much, what time did you have before you went into, into Hyatt? Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, it's kind of blurs. I think we started um, Hyatt in, where are we, 2012. So, and I think we left, I think Claire left, I'm not a hundred percent. I think maybe 2008 seems to ring a bell for how it is and maybe 2009. I'm not exactly sure. So there was a year or two years where we were just, you know, you have to go and do the darn business plan, work out the numbers, see if you can actually make this thing work. Um, so, but I, I think it's uh, these things for entrepreneurs, like, you just got to go, oh, these bumps in the road, they're just brilliant pieces of learning. There's, there's no way we would be running Hyatt as well as we are now if we hadn't had some tough things to learn. And, 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 and I mean, success doesn't really teach you a, a bunch of things, but actually when you make a mistake, it, it, you pay more attention and you learn and you, because of the feeling it gives you, you don't really particularly want to do that again. Um, but I think, yeah, so 2012, pretty much we, we started then. Um, you just touched on then about um, failure and what we learn more from. And then we discussed in the school system about creativity. Well, something else I think is important to be taught at school is, you know, the power and the learning in failure rather than everything's about you have to get top of the class and there's right or wrong. But it's like what you're saying, as long as you're putting the effort in and you're passionate about something, you're doing it you know there's no yeah. that's that's enough and and that's what like you say yeah. i learn far more from my failures than the things that i've got mm. right because that's what makes me grow it's just not selling yeah and I, I think there's an interesting experiment and I, I, it was probably in some amazing place in america you know and uh, i think a, 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 um, there was a class and he split the class into two and one half of the class had to go and make as many pots as they could um, and the other um, you know, half of the class had to go and make just one pot, make it the best they could possibly, possibly do. And so they, they'd be graded on that one pot and the other half of the class, class would be graded on just quantity. It would almost weigh, put all the pots into the weighing scales and you get a grade based on the weight. And the interesting aspect of that experiment was because they were so concentrated on just one pot, um, they only had one chance of um, it being right. Uh, whereas these didn't care. They just would go, we'll do as many pots as it, you know, it doesn't really matter. But there was more gold in the quantity than just that one piece. And so, because they learnt by doing you know, they learned how to do really good pots by doing lots of pots. And, and so they'd iterated to a, a higher level than the one who were just um, asked to do one, their best piece of work ever. And I always kind of thought that was really interesting where, you know, I do think there's a culture of learn, iterate, learn, iterate, because, you know, even Apple, you know, if you think about, you know, they, they do that all the time. They go and launch something and, and the second one is better than the first one. And so you, if you iterate as much as you can, you actually get better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned Claire a few times. So you, um, you've worked with your wife since, since 1995. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, oddly, um, I was, uh, my next door neighbor was my football manager in uh, where I was brought up. Um, and my football manager was Claire's uncle. So um, we've got a picture together when I'm three and Claire's one and a half. So, um, uh, and we, we actually started living together when I was working in New York and when I was like you know, 21. 
Um, so we've been together for a while. Um, and she's, I mean, uh, as much as I've read all the business books and she hasn't read a single one, not interested, she's definitely much better business than I am. Uh, so there's a, like a lovely tension you know, as much as uh, sometimes it frustrates the hell out of me because I'm going, let's go and do stuff. And then she'll be really pragmatic. And, and, and sometimes you need that counterbalance because I mean, if it was just me, I, I'd be there going, oh, my God. Um, so she, she grounds us. Um, and then I have to go and justify the idea by thinking it through. So it's a, a good um, thing. So we've been together, I don't know, married 27 years been doing businesses together and obviously share our lives together and two daughters and um and you know it's um you know i've learned to listen <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm asking these things because i've i've been working with my wife for the past 10 12 years and yeah, yeah. We, work, we work from home so there's kind of everything just blends into one and p- people often say to me how do you do it and i say well it's not easy um but yeah. And I think like you're saying there, it's about having that counterbalance and I can relate with that with me yeah, being to just it's, go and do stuff. But Yeah. And I remember Colin from Radiohead coming down to the farm and doing a talk and you know, telling how Radiohead worked together and everyone thinks so it's Tom. and But it's all of them together, like input in and, and stuff and... And it, there's always one person who will get more attention than the other, but it's the it's the everybody's that is important because that you know, like maybe I'll go and do the talks and Claire won't do the talks, and people go, "Oh, it's all about you, Dave." And I'm going, "Not really. Um, it's just that's that's how it has come to be." But um, we're definitely a partnership, and as she reminds me, she has one more share in Hyatt than I have. <laughs> Yeah, reminds that. me not in good times. <laughs> I heard that one in the talks. I thought, how come? Um, I'm interested. How come she got one more share? I, I literally don't know. I mean, I think the shareholder. Uh, um, oh, I think the the accountant was just like being naughty or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's kind of funny. Yeah, um, it's, it is kind of funny for sure. Um, that's really interesting. And, and you mentioned there, other spike. You know, it's it's part of the whole. And uh, I admire how much you kind of support and celebrate your staff. Like it's very it's a clever businessmen doing that, but actually just recognizing without them, there's, there is no higher. Well, I mean, it, like everything you need to know about a team, you can learn from a, a bike chain. And so there is no link more important than another link. And, um, and it's only really the, you know, the, the ego that tells entrepreneur differently. And, um, and if you can strip that away, as much as you can and just go like we're all you know we all need each other I, like um uh and without you know that, that one person it doesn't work at all and and uh, when you show people that you actually do care about them and um then you create this space um uh, where they can do the best work and and uh, not everybody in that team should be there do you mean and so and but the people who understand you know we're all in this together stay and remain and yeah and you know the, the worst thing you can do for a, a team is um you know how hire people who think they're entitled and, and that's the thing that really bugs me more than anything else i'm going oh and um we make sure we don't hire those people. You got like the team, you know, you, to be a leader, you have to serve the team and the, the, the team decide whether you're the leader, not you. And, and so, you know, being that servant leader, you go, that's you, you, you work for them. And, uh, and if you create a, a space for them to do great work, they will come in tomorrow. Uh, but the, they get the choice. Um, and I think that's really interesting where, um, you know, I know like people right now are itching to get back because they miss each other. And, 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 and it's, um, 
and yes it's hard work i mean hard work's always hard work but it it's but you can create an environment where um people want to come into work and and you and, and there's respect for hard work yeah it's rewarding isn't it Mm. Um, you talk. Is um, I noticed in one of your talks, I was listening to uh, one of your repair of jeans. Is it Paul? Is he is he enjoying the surfing okay. moment? Then, if he can't be, uh... I, know, I was going to text him and and yeah, I was uh, I was going to ask him gonna, if he had any sneaky sneaky uh, sneaky waves, um, but um, I'm sure he has. <laughs> With our listeners, just to um, um, put some context to it, I believe that you said to Paul, as your repair maker, said, if there's good waves, you can basically go and surf rather than coming to work. But you said, yeah, yeah. we're not in Hawaii yeah, yeah. here, so there's not amazing surfing. Well, uh, I, I did base the opinion we are not in Hawaii because like, then I maybe re- refigured that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, um, the thing is, he works hard on the days that he works hard. And, it's, and if, if that's important to him, you go... It's fine. I mean, like we all, like a business has to do, like it has to um, operate on lots of levels. And one is it has to, um, the, you know, you have to work for the business, but the business has to work for you. And when that relationship is intact, that's where the best work happens. When it's um, only works for one aspect then it's out of kilter and, and then it doesn't work. And, and so you've got to try and like get that yin and yang going. And so, and, 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 and like building teams is hard, but like building, but you can't build a business unless you can build a team. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we, well, you seem to be going about it the right way and, and you've got, um, you know, had good growth, slow growth over the time. But then one thing that I noticed that sort of really put you on the map a little bit more for the UK and the world was when a certain uh, princess started to wear your jeans, Meghan Markle. Um, and I, yeah. I, I was watching the story and you're saying how uh, you got a phone call. In fact, I'll let you tell the story, how it, um, how it panned out. Well, I mean, we were, as we normally do is, you know, we, you know, myself and Claire sort of talk about the business over breakfast and um, then we got a phone call to say that, um, you know, from Hugh, bless him, uh, that um, the pass had been on the phone and, um, you know, they want us to sign something. And I'm going, oh, okay. I was kind of like, you know, I like those phone calls where you suddenly go, okay, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> um, but, and, you know, we, we, we kind of sent some genes through, but we didn't hear anything, so we didn't really know. And, and we only found out on the day that she arrived in Cardiff. And, and I, I think for the team, like, when you've got a skill, and it's beautiful that the world recognizes you've got, a, like, a high skill. And so the grandmasters, suddenly, they had the world attention. Um, and, and it's nice because there's an awful lot of people get attention and they can't actually do anything um well not 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 in the grand scheme of things and so them to have that suddenly respect and renown and you know and they spent 30 years getting good at making jeans i mean it's like this isn't like an overnight thing and you know what so and when sort of sometimes you just get lucky and you could have the grace to say we had a bit of luck and they really uh, helped. And, um, but we worked so hard to get that luck. And when the luck came, we turned something around really quick that day. And you know, something went in the post that day because you know, we were like, um, we'd worked hard for the luck. And when you have the luck, you, you don't, you know, you try not to, um, uh, you, you want to capitalize on that luck. So, and you know, sometimes you get these breaks, and and not often. And but you know, just be humble about it. You go, we we got lucky. Um, but we'd we'd done the hard yards to get there. Done the hard yards. Yeah, definitely. And and then off that, did you heard something that you got like literally hundreds of mo- well months worth of orders in like one night. Yeah, I mean, we were um, 
almost for a year trying to catch up with orders. We had to move factory and uh, I mean, if you build an app and it's really incredibly successful overnight, um, you, you don't have to do very much. You've already built the damn thing. But with jeans, you have to go make each pair. And I mean, actually factories like consistent, you know, like growth. But when you suddenly have a massive spike, you it you've got to go and hire more people, get more machines, you know, move factory, and it's um, it's it, it's it's nice problems. But you so you know, nice problems have to be solved too, um, and um, and sometimes they're not always quick. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, like you know, bless you know, that that really helped us. So there's no <laughs> there's no other way to say that we just got a bit lucky at, at that point and. I, and I feel for the team, I've just gone, oh, yes. It, it put us, it gave us confidence. Uh, and um, and that's really nice when, you know, somebody shines the spotlight on you and you feel like, well, you, you know, you worked your, you, you know, you worked your, your hands off for seven years to get there. And it, so it feels like it was well we were lucky, but we really were grateful for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just thinking when you say seven years, I'm trying to work out how many, maybe that's the 30,000 hours or the 10,000 hours of time. Yeah. And, then, and then it comes to, to fruition. Um, yeah. But, but what thing, what seems like one of the lovely stories to come off that boost in sales and to move factories is that you actually move back into the original factory. Yeah, so, yeah where they used to make 35,000 jeans. Yeah, and so, I mean, that's, you know, talk about the, you know, the salmon going swimming back up the river to where it was born. It was, you know, the, you know, the grand masters going back to literally within a few feet of where they used to make jeans. And, and there's another aspect to that story is like, you know, in the top building is where we used to run Howie's. So we were going back as well. So it was like, um, and we went back initially just to see before we signed up, you know, uh, to take the factory on is just to make sure that the energy was right. Um, and, uh, and I, I sort of asked the team, you know, does, does the energy feel right here? And, you know, and shall we this time go and complete the mission? Amazing. Yeah, it just seemed, I remember seeing it, the video, and you, you went in, you, took, you had your kids in with you, and the Grand Masters, and just seeing the sign on the wall, and the space looked beautiful. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, incredible. So what, so you, I'm assuming you've not got the space to fit 400 in there over time, or would, would you? Well, uh, I mean, probably, actually. I mean, there's, there's, we got one, you know, one third of it, there's another two thirds, and then there's another bit. So we got some room to grow. Um, but what I say to the team is going to look, it's, it's good to have in these big goals, but like, what if we just do this today is try and get better today than we were yesterday and see what that brings to us. Um, and, and if we can keep doing that, I think that's going to make us pretty interested. Yeah. Um, one route I'd like to go on now and talk about is because obviously your advertising background, your writing background, it's very, and you know, the power of story and um, a couple of quotes that I picked out from some of your stuff was one like, you know, the internet is for the maker is like the Holy grail. And also mm -hmm. who tells the best story and who makes the best product wins. So yeah. not only do you make the best product, but it's the story that you wrap it around and the meaning and it has, there's no doubt there's a, there's a mission there, but you build on that yeah. and it's gone off from there. So I'd love to hear more on that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I mean, you know, there's, if you think about it, you know, like the grandmasters can make one of the best genes on the planet. And so, um, but we also need to go and tell our story well and so um and if you think about like, what's more important you know if you you know if you if that was you know if you think about you know your left leg being you know the ability to make and then the right leg is the ability to go and tell your story and and which which leg's more important you go well we kind of need both 
and you know I, I do believe in the power of a brand uh, and and if we reduce the, a brand down into its very very essence it's a story and uh, and so you know it's if you think about you know why Nike beat Adidas ultimately it was Nike was a better storyteller than Adidas um, and it's extraordinary um, because Adidas was so far ahead uh, so I mean the ability to uh, tell your story so another person another human being you know can connect to that is real power and uh, and so the story does matter and um, and the one thing I learned at Saatchi's is the power of your ability to tell your story and and um, and people say, oh, you know, it's just marketing. You go like, what if you make the best product on, on the planet and no one knows? Uh, even worse, what if you make the best product on the planet and no one cares? And, and, and marketing is about telling your story so someone, so another human being actually cares about it and they understand how good it is. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you know, marketing is really about, you know, like reminding people that there is a choice. You can buy a great product or you can buy an, you know, an inferior one. And I would much prefer people buy one pair of jeans from us that last years than, you know, 10 pairs of jeans that don't last, you know, that long at all. Um, so, so yeah, the, the ability to tell our story is something I have learned. So. And what's so nice about you guys is you, because often companies will tell a story, but the product doesn't match it. But your product, no doubt, you know, it's it's up there with with the stories that goes oh. on. The brand. Yeah, and I mean, I think when you put the, a couple of things together, is when you go into, you know, there's a couple of aspects to you know jeans making, and one is, are you willing to go and buy the best fabric on the planet? Then. Then there's the make. And if you can put those two things together, so the ability to make is for us, we have to do, you know, there's, there's only like 75 things that we have to do, but we have to be world-class at 75 of them in order to make the best genes. And when you put those, the ability to make and the ability to go and source the best you know, denim, because a lot of companies actually can't afford the best denim because their margin doesn't uh, allow them to but because we're direct to consumer is we're not paying a middleman. Uh, and so suddenly we can go and buy the best materials and they can't. Uh, and, and we have, you know, like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 hours of learning how to make jeans in the team. When you can bind those two things together, I mean, that's where you get pretty interested. And, and, um, we and that's why we don't have to go make bubble caps or um, perfume. Is like doing a product almost better than anyone um, on the planet. There's enough business there for us to grow. Yeah, and like you say, because of the internet, you know. The, yeah, the I mean, it's 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 level the playing field. I mean, you know. Um, yeah, as soon as you have a, a website, you're a global company. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the ability to tell your story well, so your story travels freer, further, and faster than ever. You know, suddenly you go, okay, we've got a chance. And, and before, it was always about the brands who had the most money. Uh, and now it's about, you know, like, you know, like who, who can tell their story so and build their community and and, and it, it's it's an extraordinary time for um you know, a maker yeah absolutely and, and something that seems to have worked well for you as well is the, the hugely popular scrapbook chronicles the your email newsletter system yeah. that you've got going out like how how long has that been going for well it, it came out of a crisis um and um when we first started, we had uh, an amazing start, um, an amazing, you know, we were pretty much in every newspaper that you can imagine. Um, and we had like six months worth of orders in, you know, the first four weeks. 
And I was there going, oh my God. Uh, and we literally couldn't keep up with the demand. Uh, so I made the decision to go and um, close the website uh, while we went and found you know, some more makers. Um, but also um, uh, we got all the back orders out. And, and then about three months later, we reopened the website and going, woohoo! Um, and uh, all our customers had gone away. They either had the genes or they'd forgotten about us. And um, it was in that moment where I suddenly realized actually, um, you know, we were putting a lot of effort into social media. And, you know, 8% of our time was in social media and it was giving us 20% of our sales. And 20% of our effort was going into our newsletter and it was giving us 80% of our sales. And I just went in that, uh, sometimes a crisis makes you really, you know, focus on actually, you know, what is the answer uh, as opposed to what's cool. And I'm going, right, everything now has to be all about building our newsletter. Uh, and it's been a real focus for us. Uh, and yeah, and we've sort of, become quite known for it. And, you know, Wall Street Journal wrote a big article about the renaissance of the email and they featured us. And, and you know, we had, we came to that conclusion in a crisis. So you go actually, you know, doing this thing, this thing that nobody really truly cares about. Nobody really cares about newsletters, except they've grown our business. They, they helped us survive and they helped us to thrive. And, um, and in the end, I, you know, I was so like wanting other people to understand how important it was, you know, to have a brilliant newsletter. I ended up you know, like writing a book about it. I ended up writing um, articles about it. I ended up doing workshops together and, and you suddenly go, and people go, oh yeah, it does work. I went, yeah. And guess what? No one's paying attention to it. Everyone's on Instagram. Hey, they're worried about the, which filter they're going to have. And, and I'm there again. Great. Um, I'm glad, the, glad their attention's over there because the business is over here. Yeah. Yeah. So how many have you got on the actual list, if you don't mind saying? I think it's growing all the time. I mean, it's, um, I think it's heading towards 40,000 people. Um, and uh, again, it's like, it's actually in, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually really small, but oh, oh, uh, people will make the mistake on how big is the list. You go, no, no, no wrong question. How engaged is yeah. the community? Um, because like, you can have a million people and nobody care what you do. You can have a hundred people and that can be an incredible business. So it's, it's really how much you know, they, um, the community is bubbling. Um, that really uh, actually, you know, that's, that's the true measure. But people always want to know the size. And you go, Mm -mm. wrong question i don't know whether it was an article maybe or even a book but i know tim ferris shared about it It was like a thousand true fans and from a thousand true fans that's an, that can be enough to have a yeah, yeah. great successful business yeah no and that, that was like um a kevin kelly article about um if you and you got one thousand true fans um yeah you know the article was really saying about like, well, they'll buy everything that you put out there. They'll go to every concert you go to. And, and the economics are then you can give up your job in order to pursue uh, the rock band. And, and it is that thing of um, if you can really look after your community and you foster it and you care about it, um, they kind of know that you care about them. Uh, and I think that's, um, uh, so, and people, you know, go and chase big numbers. You go, well, go and, you know, build a relationship with your people. And it doesn't actually matter so much about the size, but it doesn't matter about the intensity of the relationship where they actually care about you and you care about them. And they will know. And, and passion is leadership, if you think about it in that way. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned before that you've read all the business books and, you know, um, yeah. so what, um, is there any particular books or authors or anything that you kind of podcasters, anything that you just think particularly around books that you would definitely recommend for other people who are either in the early stages of, of creating a product or the looking to launch one, you know? 
Well, I mean, there's uh, there's always good books, and it, like before, I recommend a book is like I think people have to understand the importance of rereading that book because the uh, first time you kind of get it, and then you know you think you get it. Actually, the second time you go, oh my god, and the third time you read it, you go, oh, we're all, we're always in a quest for new knowledge, and I'm going. We should really spend more time rereading the books that we've got, and and actually. You know, this is sounds like dumb advice, but it's probably not. It's like underlining everything, taking notes from everything. Where, like you, don't, you probably only have to read ten books, but you have to understand them. And um, you know, I think Yvonne Chenard's "Let My People Go Surfing" is is a great book. Um, I'd recommend that. My old boss uh, Paul Arden um, wrote a book. Um, it's not how good you are; it's how good you want to be. I mean, it's a great book. Um, there's a, a book here. Um, there's, it's really actually quite hard to get hold of. It's called The Republic of Tea. And it's a, a, about, you know, people are going to start a tea business and they were faxing each other about what the purpose of this company was going to be. And it's a really fascinating book because I haven't seen any book really like in that format before. Um, but it really helps you understand what you need to think about if you're going to go and build a brand, you know, make it purpose driven, you know, you know, what are the things that give it its voice? Um, so, you know, but again, rather than just like, I, my bigger thing is go and go and reread the books that resonate with you and stop like go and stop searching for new information because there's some old gold. Just go and read, reread it. Yeah. Yeah, and it ties into that part, bit of the theme of this, you know, of wanting things, what's new and chasing after um, growth and all, you know, all this sort of stuff. And actually, what we've got, it's a bit, we're going through this time now with the, the crisis we're in and we're realizing, well, you know, what's important to us and it's actually what we've already got. It's being grateful for what we've got already. Yeah, no, completely. Yeah, completely. And um, the quest for new is like, like um, you know, you know, we've got a lot. We're super lucky. And how often are we telling ourselves that? Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, you've talked in here about it's been like, you know, it's down to its patience. It's letting it seem, you know, seeing things grow, working hard. But I'm interested how you counter that in your own life in terms of to help you, if you work so hard, so your business is your life in a way. Um, what do you do in your own time to sort of like chill out and, and wind down? So it's not just 24 seven. Cause I know myself, yeah. what I feel like. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, um, I'm pretty sure all entrepreneurs have a, a, an issue with, you know, being able to switch off. I, I know I do. And, um, and I'm trying to learn that thing. And Claire is much better at it. Um, where she just leaves the business behind and I'm, I'm sort of, I'm still in the learning phase of it where I'm going, um, and there's a quote that I, I keep thinking about a lot and it's, um, um, and it goes by like something like this, which is, um, the, the problem is we're not all in at work and the other problem is we're not all off at home. And so, you know, we're distracted you know, in both worlds. And if we could become less distracted in business and be more focused and you know do deep work not shallow work we'd get more done and if we were actually um, you know, away from our phone at home and not you know, um, you know bring in work home with us um, we would rest better and so and, and that for me is a, a challenge because I don't really view work as work which is the problem because um, uh, it's like I'm gonna I'm really into it um, so, so then to leave that behind is the challenge. So, um, but I, I'm trying to be more disciplined with it and, you know, like, you know, step away from the, the phone and, you know, there's no point um, having it anywhere near you because we can't resist. So, you know, so you go, um, so I'm working on that. I'm, 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 uh, I'm just so you know, and everyone knows I'm definitely not there yet, but, I'm sort of making efforts to get there because actually I think rest is a superpower. Um, if you think about 
uh, I don't know, I think which Olympians um, story it was, but it was like how they beat all these other runners is on their days off, they did nothing. They literally did nothing. And all these, uh, I don't know if it was the American runners, they'd be going to like their PR events and this and that. And it was the Kenyans, they go, no, we're not doing anything. So when they were running, they were running. And when they were resting, they were doing rest. <laughs> so I, I do love that quote. So, uh, you know, ask me in six months time if I, I've got better. So, um, but it is the challenge for the entrepreneur to be able to switch off. Because they like it. I mean, it's, they're into it. It's not actually work for them. It's, it's not work for me. And, the, and that's the, the hard part is going I actually really enjoy it. It doesn't feel like work. I can put a, I can, you know, put a lot of effort into it. And but Claire's very good. Going, hey, this is family time. So come on. That's good. I, I, one in fear as well. So you talking about with Claire, like the balance seems, you know, it's so important. You see other entrepreneurs, and it doesn't seem they have that. It's like you know, it's a million miles an hour, and the balance is is completely off. So it's um, yeah. Yeah, and they're they're running a marathon but they're sprinting and you know and that's why you will read about amazing people burning out because they didn't understand it was the marathon and they were just sprinting and and it might be a metaphor that everybody understands and, and it might be a cliche but it's a truth so so you can't run the marathon like it's a sprint but you can it's just not going to make it to the end yeah, I um, yeah, and you know what? I could. I, I normally finish my interviews with a question, which is asking people to offer some advice on what good would they do, um, how can they go out and do their own bit of good in the world. But basically, you, the entire interview has been has been nuggets of wisdom and advice. So I won't even I won't even bother asking a question because you've you've already answered it about fifteen times. Yeah. Um, but what I would say so who who's out there now in the world? that you're admiring that's doing good. I know you talked about Patagonia um, and they're, you know, they're doing it on like a massive level, but who about sort of it? industries, companies, individuals? Uh, well, yeah. I think there's, um, it, it's tricky. And I mean, the answer is probably there's not enough uh, people out there really using business in an extraordinary way. But uh, I, I mean, I think Jason Freed at Basecamp is is doing interesting things because he, the way he's working with his team, I think I think there are an awful lot of uh, cryptocurrency programmers that are going to go and change money, um, and we don't really know much about them currently. Uh, I think we will know much more about them at some point. Um, but I guess what I'd love is for more. My problem with Patagonia is there's not enough of them. There's not enough Patagonias in the world. And um, and I think we need to, you know, get more founders to um, think about their communities in a different way and thinking about starting businesses in a different way. So my, you know, my heroes are you know, yet to start their companies. Well, in a way, you've answered that that last question that I've kept out. It's, it's to inspire people to go out and actually do their own bit of good to to start off and mm. and to have that you know responsibility. of feeling like you're not doing it so much for yourself. It's that service to others. You've got a mission. That's what's driving you on in the world, and and that's what keeps yeah. you going and many others going. To have that you know that energy that will keep you going for your entire life. Yeah, no, and because I mean, if you're only doing it for the money. Is and when the money doesn't arrive as quickly as you want, you kind of lose faith in this thing because it was, it was based on money. And but if you're doing it to serve your people, your community, then you have more grit to it. And grit really is about understanding why you're not going to quit. Uh, and and then at that point you just go. Um, and then in the end, actually, because you don't quit and actually you do things that serve your community, the money does come. And that's the, that's the whole essence that people, like they chase the money and the money doesn't come. And, the, and then there's a bunch of founders out there who chase 
serving uh, the community or trying to make some change in this world that they want to happen, then they achieve that and then the money comes and you go, oh, actually, but the, the money wasn't the first reason. It's just, it's just a consequence of doing something that uh, your community really wanted and you wanted. And so it's like a byproduct. And the problem is that right now, you know, the, for a lot of founders, is the money's the only reason. And that is going to allow them to lose and it's going to allow them to quit. Because when the money doesn't turn up, they'll get discouraged. Yeah. Yeah, really great advice. Well, I think on that, Dave, we can um, kind of uh, wrap up today's interview. What, if people are listening to this and they want to connect with you and they want to get hold of a pair of jeans, what's the, what's the best way to uh, find you? Well, I mean, um, you know, the website, hyattdenham.co.uk. Um, yeah, we're happy to make uh, jeans for the, you know, the most creative people on the planet. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's, you know that that's the joy i mean you know i'm a, i'm around on various bits of social media now and again when i but then i kind of like i dip in and i dip out and i'm not always there kind of um but yeah the website's probably the best way brilliant well it's been absolutely amazing speaking to you and i can't wait to to share this one with my audience and i'm sure it'll inspire them because it's it's great to have someone who has really been you know has set up multiple companies who's got so much wisdom to pass on it's not like i'm just speaking to someone in the 20s who's who's got a lucky break it's someone who's you know tried and tested so um and for me like it's a pleasure for me to to get this information from you so um so thank you david great pleasure and thanks for your time so there we have it guys there is my interview with david from uh, hyatt jeans uh, all wrapped up i just absolutely enjoyed that it's a real privilege for me to be able to sit down and uh, and talk with someone who's got so much experience and so much wisdom um and you know i can vouch for the company in terms of you know the the quality of what they've got on their jeans is um is amazing and and it's just how they're about the going out and having a mission um, so anyway, guys, if you enjoyed it, please share this episode with a friend. That would really help the podcast and it will help the, the Denim Jeans company as well. And if you listen to it on Apple Podcasts, please leave me a review. That will go down really well to help um, boost the ratings for it. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can uh, subscribe for future episodes as well. And also my Patreon page, which I really appreciate the people who already support me on there. But if you wish to contribute, um to this podcast then that would help me to continue to put out um uh, exciting content with uh, amazing people that are doing good in the world so anyway guys uh, thank you for your time today until next time have a good one <laughs>